This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning. Welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning, uh, our speaker is Dr. William Jordan, uh, who is our uh, division director in uh, the Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy. Uh, Dr. Jordan went to medical school at Emory and then is, did his residency at uh, University of Alabama, uh, Birmingham, and then came back to Emory and did his vascular surgery training and then went back to UAB where he was uh, later the division director uh, there. Uh, he's uh, come back to Emory to be the division director here. He's on numerous uh, editorial boards uh, and has been a great uh, colleague and, and partner within our Heart and Vascular uh, Center. Will? Thank you, Andy. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I uh, look forward to uh, this next uh, hour or so of discussion, and I thank you for being open to a surgeon's view of uh, treating carotid artery stenosis. Uh, carotid disease has been a passion of mine uh, ever since I uh, learned from Bob Smith, who would so elegantly do a carotid uh, procedure in 70 minutes. He, was, uh, he would do it with minimal blood loss and uh, um, uh, expert uh, technique and have uh, great results. So first, my disclosures. Uh, I have none by pure CME standards to let you know that I am involved with some uh, industry and some consulting activities, but all of those funds are paid directly to Emory. I think that's important to keep that in, in perspective as I go through this. I do want to outline three objectives for you as listed here. I want to review some of the current management for carotid disease. I want to talk a little bit about uh, comparative, uh, uh, comparing some anesthetic techniques. I know uh, commonly cardiology gets consulted for, quote, clearance. Uh, you ought to hear the discussion from the anesthesiologist about cardiology clearance, probably the same thing that cardiologist says about anesthesiologist in cardiology clearance. Don't laugh too loud. And then I want to assess some new techniques on how we treat carotid disease. First, uh, let's establish what the problem is and recognize that stroke really affects many, many Americans, and it has a, over a $13 billion health care cost. Uh, there are many prevention modalities out there, but uh, medical therapy still, I believe, is the first line of therapy and should be uh, used primarily uh, once the disease is identified. And that's, I don't have to tell this audience about the importance of managing atherosclerotic disease but clearly medical disease, uh, medical management is very important um, in terms of antiplatelet therapy, um, uh, cholesterol uh, modification, and overall cardiovascular health. But regardless, we still have a substantial amount of disease uh, that occurs, and we know that uh, up to 40% uh, of strokes potentially are related to carotid artery stenosis, and we here in Atlanta live very, very um, uh, squarely in the stroke belt. Uh, I'm not certain if that's all the diabetes or uh, simply our biscuit poisoning that we have, but we have a pretty dramatic um, uh, prevalence of carotid uh, disease and stroke right here in the southeast, and this is why it becomes a problem. Uh, finally, I would mention that carotid artery stenosis uh, is really the only peripheral artery, so I'm not going to touch the coronary arteries. I'm, I'm staying out of the heart. I'm going to leave that to you experts. But it's the only peripheral artery that has level class 1 evidence that says repairing for asymptomatic disease can improve survival and can improve stroke reduction. And this is important because uh, we talk a lot about oculostenotic reflex. Well, this is one area that potentially we could treat before symptoms ever occur. And this CT scan demonstrates some pretty severe carotid stenosis. Now, again, <clears throat> when you get at my point in career, you get to think historically. So I'm going to take you a little bit through the history of treatment of carotid disease and point out that the first carotid endarterectomy, while there's some uh, disagreement whether it happened in Texas or in uh, England, uh, it was over 50 years ago. And it was really once uh, we started to, in the surgical world appreciate what could be done for carotid disease. That was in the 60s and the 70s when there was just a huge, uh, uh, and I'll say 70s and 80s, it was a very uh, huge wave of intervention for carotid artery disease, specifically carotid endarterectomy. And uh, actually, though, there were some uh, higher than expected um, stroke rates, and that led to some of the early studies, uh, the NACID and ACAS study sitting down here. And that's really what uh, occurred in the 80s and published in the early 90s. And then this was all related to carotid endarterectomy. And then it was in the 90s we started to see development of new treatments, specifically carotid artery stenting, some starting here, some being initiated at University of Alabama. Uh, and I'll take you through some of that series. And that's where we really are um, in the 2010s, 
about some mix between treating carotid disease between endarterectomy and carotid stenting versus medical therapy. I'll take you through the first two major studies. The NASIT study was published in New England Journal in 1991. That was actually when I was in surgical residency, and so it got a lot of attention. And so you understand the background. It was over 600 patients that were randomized, and we still did a fair amount of randomization uh, for some surgical studies. And they looked at the two and a half year stroke rate between these 600 patients, and it was substantially lower in the surgically treated arm at 9%, so two and a half, uh, two and a half year stroke rate was 9%, versus the medical treatment arm was 26%. Incidentally, the study was designed to go five years, and it did in some of the uh, of subcategories, but essentially it was stopped at two and a half years for these major group because there was a very large stroke uh, difference. And most importantly, probably this standard uh, that is still used today, the operative stroke and mortality risk at one month, the 30-day result, and that's what commonly what surgeons use, is just below 6%. And that's become the accepted standard of the stroke and death rate for symptomatic carotid disease needs to be less than 6% to be appropriate. And you can see the other differences. Interestingly, even in those who didn't have surgery, their stroke risk was about half that at 3.5%, probably because of the unstable plaque. And it has to do with some timing, uh, which we'll touch on later. <clears throat> Let's talk now about uh, the uh, ACAS study. That was the asymptomatic carotid atherosclerosis study published in JAMA in 94, so three years after the earlier study, over 1,600 patients were randomized, 800 in each arm, surgical arm versus medical arm. And if you notice that these patients, they did get uh, carried to five years, and you can see the five-year stroke risk for the surgical arm was 5.1%. The five-year stroke risk for the medical arm was 11%. Now, I've starred that uh, note at the bottom because uh, as the surgeons, and you know how we are, so it's very sensitive about our results. Uh, that we started looking down where this was, and the 30-day operative stroke and mortality risk was 2.3%. 1.2 was related to the preoperative arteriogram. That's actually where the move came out in the 90s to start limiting arteriograms because, gee, there's a 1% stroke risk. Now, incidentally, you can interpret this ACAST data in a couple of different ways. It depends upon what you're selling. You can say that uh, the, the pearl that I like to teach uh, a lot of our um, surgery residents and uh, vascular fellows is that the real pearl to take home is for surgical treated arm, there's a 1% per risk of stroke per year. If you're medically treated, it's 2%. So if you're selling carotid endarterectomy, I can stand up and say, I can cut your stroke risk in half. If you're not selling surgery and you're selling medical therapy, you can say, oh, it's only 1% versus 2% difference. So it sort of depends upon your perspective. I actually use this number as a very good standard to also consider one's life expectancy because this is really when you make a decision about how aggressive to be for asymptomatic disease. So uh, this uh, report actually came out, I think it was 1996, American Heart got together a, a multidisciplinary ad hoc committee to establish some recommendations on what's important or what's appropriate for doing carotid uh, revascularization. If the lesion is symptomatic, if the patient is symptomatic relative to a carotid lesion and the stenosis is greater than 50%, the stroke risk should be less than 6%. You need to examine your local results. If the patient has no symptoms and the, and the stenosis is greater than 60%, the operative stroke and mortality risk should be less than 3%. So the asymptomatics, you got to be a little better. And I basically tell the, the uh, uh, residents and fellows we're teaching, you don't get very many freebies. When you're treating an asymptomatic patient, you basically get one stroke out of 100. If you get more than one, then you're in trouble. And you don't really do that many, so you've got to be just about perfect on this disease when you're treating an asymptomatic patient. So why do patients come to us with asymptomatic carotid stenosis? I think ultimately this depends a lot upon your definition uh, on what they want treated and also the perspective. Too often I see patients, or very often I see patients, not too often, happy to see patients, uh, who come to us with an expectation of getting some improvement related to carotid revascularization. Grandma's not quite the same. If you fix this carotid artery, suddenly she'll be bright and she'll be back to her 25-year-old self. Well, I see enough gray hair in the room to recognize that that's not the case, that we know that uh, sometimes we treat this artery and people don't get back to that baseline status, but some patients come with that perspective. There also can be a difference in what you call symptomatic and asymptomatic, and I'll touch on that first. First, I want to touch on this perspective. Let me drop over to a random factoid. I spent a few years in Alabama, and so this is one of these facts, that, uh, one of these random facts that comes up, that 11.2% of Alabama men are perverts. Sort of gets your attention, right? Yeah, any Alabama blood in here besides myself? No, incidentally, I am originally from this, this city, uh, but my dad's family comes from Alabama, so I do have some of that. 
you say, okay, but first you got to what? You have to define what a pervert is, right? Well, if you live in Alabama for a little while, you realize that they have a real big uh, football uh, um, passion that goes throughout the state. So when you get to Alabama, they define a pervert as someone who loves his wife more than football. So I tell you, bring that point up to let you realize that it depends on how you define something about, for example, being symptomatic or asymptomatic. And that's when uh, this publication came out. And I think it's been accepted as uh, published in the uh, Society for Vascular Surgery, the JVS uh, journal. It's been accepted by other disciplines, too, because it's actually adopted from the neurology literature. You know, it's sort of important because you have to figure out when someone is truly symptomatic from a carotid artery lesion. And it's not always clear. I don't expect you to be reading that in the back of the room, so let me help you here. It was defined uh, in the neurology literature and subsequently published in the vascular literature that you have to have a history of stroke, amaurosis, or TIA involving that ipsilateral carotid within the last 180 days. So if you occlude on the contra side and you had a little stroke and you're okay and you got asymptomatic on the other side, this is still considered asymptomatic. It has to be the corresponding hemisphere. The weak and dizzies, that's over here in the fine print, the weak and dizzies that someone has, that's considered asymptomatic. Now, incidentally, I'm not certain that's exactly true in terms of I've seen patients who truly have global malperfusion and you can reperfuse them and they can get better. But if you're really looking at your reporting standards and what you're selecting on how to treat these patients, that patient gets classified as asymptomatic, which also means your stroke risk has to be very, very low. It has to be less than 3% to have efficacious results. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about symptomatic and asymptomatic. Now, I also want to talk about what's that high-risk patient, because that's the other real question. How do you manage the high-risk patient? And the real question, and we sort of divide it some into anatomic or, or, uh, and physiologic, or you could think about it surgical and medical, sort of uh, anatomically what's high risk and difficult to get to and what is medically a difficult patient to handle. I want to talk about medical risk, and I do this with a little bit of caution and trepidation among this uh, audience, but uh, I still have some areas that we look and when we're assessing our patients each day. Now, one thing I do when I look at the patient is, again, I want to consider their life expectancy. And the standard numbers, we want to expect at least two years of life expectancy to get benefit from treating an asymptomatic disease, particularly when you consider that, uh, that difference in 1% uh, versus 2%. So and also, when I see the high-risk patient, I think it's important they get optimized before they go through any uh, carotid revascularization. And there's still some question about what truly is high risk. And there were some, uh, uh, some randomized studies about outcomes, but I wanted to look specifically at this series that came from uh, some of our work at UAB. It's about a 10-year perspective, and we, we're doing about 50 asymptomatics a year. Not a huge volume, would be considered high volume by some Medicare standards, but not huge by some standards. But we did uh, examine 500 patients who were treated over a 10-year period, looking specifically at survival and also stroke, and, uh, uh, stroke rate and death rate at 30 days. And this has been peer-reviewed and published. But let me show, we were specifically looking at the medical high-risk group. And here are the risk factors that we used, uh, the standard uh, blood pressure, uh, smoking, uh, uh, lipid uh, status, uh, lung disease, diabetes, uh, coronary disease, kidney disease, and age, age greater than 80. And uh, after we'd had, uh, had a pretty uh, robust data set that was collecting all this prospectively, and then we examined retrospectively, and then identify those patients who had statistically significant hazard ratios, and there were only five. Coronary disease, kidneys, heart, kidneys, lungs, age, and diabetes. Only five that panned out of those uh, multiple risk factors. Not surprising. Based upon their hazard ratio, they got a little bit different uh, risk. You can see uh, heart disease was two points, kidney was three, lung disease was uh, uh, three points, and then we had diabetes and uh, age greater than 80, each is one point. And this became important because that was really sort of our dividing line. We looked at our 30-day results. It did not differ. I can get the high-risk heart patient, bad kidney patient through a 30-day result. There was no difference between the two. But when we started to look at overall mortality, first we had three-year data. This is 10 years of patients we gathered, but we had pretty robust three-year data. The overall mortality was almost 15%. And if you had a score value of less than two, less than or equal to two, then you only had a 6.5% three-year mortality. If your uh, score value was greater than two, so three or more, you had almost one in three patients who died within that time period. So if you had just bad heart and everything else was okay, very appropriate. But if you had bad heart and diabetes, that's probably too much. Bad kidneys, there's a lot of question about this, about, hmm, are you really getting value? 
Incidentally, when we published this, there was disagreement among the authors, um, all who were surgeons, I should mind you. This is the KM plot that shows us the uh, uh, score value of greater than two or less than two. And you can see the top line clearly has a better value because the 30-day result was the same. And so I argued it wasn't so much that we were causing harm with doing the carotid revascularization. I thought it was more attention to treating the medical condition afterwards. In other words, we could get them through the acute phase. Did we have some cardiac insult that made them have a higher risk later, or were we not quite as attentive towards their medical condition afterwards? And I will still take the occasional high-risk patient through carotid revascularization. I'm just a little bit more cautious about, uh, about pushing through it would be the way to answer that. So uh, that really talks some about the physiologic, the medical high-risk patient and how we view them. Uh, and I think that uh, while people have different tools that they can use to look specifically at what becomes important in terms of the high-risk uh, patient, I think that ultimately you gotta consider those patients very carefully and what their life expectancy is when you're treating asymptomatic disease. Next is how severe disease. Here's a pretty uh, messy table that uh, really just demonstrates uh, multiple different publications looking at the risk of ipsilateral deficits according to the severity of the carotid stenosis. And so the cut line is probably right here. If there's 75% stenosis, the uh, stroke risk for uh, um, uh, asymptomatic carotid stenosis is about 3% per year, but if it's less than that, it's probably 1% per year. So maybe we could take that cut line somewhere at 70 to 80% stenosis. And I said, that sounds reasonable, but then you have to figure out how you calculate stenosis. And I believe in the cardiology world, you do uh, what we would call the European method, where you look basically uh, at the um, lumen of what the projected diameter is of the target artery. I'm going to break this into a different slide. I think it will help you. But there are two different methods out there. The ECST, also known as a European method, and the NASET method is the lower uh, segment, the lower graph below, the North American uh, um, carotid trial that I showed to you earlier. And the NASID method is really what's used more frequently today. Let me take this into this graph because I think this demonstrates it better. The real bottom line when you're calculating carotid stenosis, particularly angiographically, it all depends upon this B variable. This B variable is what your reference diameter is. By the European method, that reference diameter is right here, uh, is the bulb. But, uh, but when we're doing an arteriogram and you get a luminogram, you don't know exactly what that diameter is. So the North American method, the nascent method, actually looks at the normal diameter of the distal internal carotid as the reference diameter. Why? It's part of the scientific method. That's the most reproducible method to figure out how severe the stenosis is. Well, the real ultimate, uh, let, let me take you through an example then of what that is. Here's sort of some typical numbers that you might see relative to a carotid artery, where A being the distal internal carotid, and that diameter typically is about five millimeters, B is the the uh, diameter of the carotid bulb, the internal carotid is typically slightly dilated at this bifurcation zone, not unusual to be about eight millimeters. And particularly when you see a carotid lesion and this minimal residual lumen, MRL, I know that's a familiar term in this audience, MRL, and that diameter might be two millimeters, sometimes it's one, one to two millimeters. And if you looked at these two different calculations by European method, if you use B as the reference diameter, this stenosis comes up at 75%. If you use a NASET diameter, that stenosis comes up 60%. Well, does this really matter? Well, yes, it matters because you can reproduce it, and that really is a standard by which you make decisions on how aggressive to be relative to carotid disease, because it has some to do with that plaque burden that's there. I will also realize that this method, the NASET method, clearly can underestimate the degree of stenosis. But if you keep that in mind when you're comparing this to ultrasound CTs, MR, or what else you're doing, it still gives you a reproducible, consistent method that you can identify those patients, and one observer will have at least a closer number compared to the next observer. Here's another example that I've uh, thrown up here just to show you how NASA can underestimate it. Because here, if one had a, had a minimal residual lumen, the C diameter of five millimeters, by the European method, it still would be 63% stenosis. That's what the pathologist would tell me if I pulled the whole bulb out and sent it to him uh, to look at it under the microscope. But by the NASA method, if you have a 5% minimal residual lumen, it's 0% stenosis. Keep this in mind, because the NASA study, the ACAST study, these all work off NASA stenosis. That's why the 60% number, most people say, oh, I don't operate on 60% stenosis. 
I want you to acknowledge that ultrasound commonly will categorize that differently than the arteriogram. <clears throat> when you look at the combination of our newer imaging modalities, CT, MR, and the old standard angiogram, there's a difference between the two. CT actually has been my favorite contrast uh, um, imaging modality. I still use ultrasound modes, but I feel like CT is less invasive. It does have some potential vulnerabilities because it can be obscured if there's too much calcification and you have to play with windowing at the uh, workstation to really figure it out. Sometimes you can't, but it still has been reasonable, and that's uh, really where I look for minimal residual lumen at about 1.3 or less. That's sort of that magic number when it's probably up to 70%. MRA is nice, except that sometimes it can overestimate stenosis. You also have to deal with the claustrophobia that patients uh, encounter. So sometimes that can be off. And then the angiogram, still as a gold standard, does carry some risk. The published risk uh, is 1% uh, stroke risk simply from manipulating the catheter in the uh, supraaortic vessels. Uh, some have obviated that risk by not selecting, but then your imaging quality is reduced, and that's why I think selection is probably most important. It just takes some extra care. And I think there are times, and uh, surgeons are probably just as guilty as this uh, as any discipline, that we sort of sit back and look at a lesion. And here's one. It was actually a patient that I got to follow in Birmingham who had been treated elsewhere at a different state uh, that uh, was judged 70% stenosis and entered into one of the randomized protocols, the CREST protocol. Well, CREST doesn't have core lab that looks at it, so the operator says that's 70% stenosis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe that's 70% stenosis based upon the methodology I just showed you. Sometimes we look at it and say it's bad enough to treat. Now, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time talking about carotid duplex, but I would acknowledge that the duplex velocities on this lesion, this patient was treated in January 2007, and I look at these velocities, and this shows that this peak velocity of 210, 179, 200 really shows stability of the lesion. I would have treated this asymptomatic patient with uh, medical therapy. Uh, not revascularization because I can demonstrate a uh, what I would say clearly less than 70% stenosis and stable du duplex velocities. So I just tell you that to be aware of some angiographic interpretation, and that's why we surgeons like to look at pictures sometimes instead of read words. Uh, we can talk about literacy later, but I think it points out that actually looking at the images can make a real difference. That's the CT scan that correlates with the same and the other imaging. So I wanted to shift gears and talk a little bit about carotid nodorectomy and then the different treatment options. I've talked about symptoms. I've talked about how we measure stenosis. Now let's talk about what we can do. And I'd like to say they're always just pretty and clean, but that's a nice plaque. And it is, uh, I'll tell you, very gratifying to see a nice plaque removed. You get to put it in your hands and uh, look at it because you realize you probably have prevented some of this embolization, or at least I like to reassure myself uh, after I've subjected the patient uh, through an operation. But just as in uh, so much in the vascular world, much of this has shifted the endovascular suite. And so that's why we had this combination of trying to figure out how much we do open and how much we do endovascular. Now, for the carotid stenters in the room, I, I think there's some back there. This is, you might recognize this old picture. That's a very long balloon in a carotid stenosis with no stent, no distal protection. It's one of the early ones I saw. I think it was about 94, 95 at UAB. Uh, it really demonstrates that the, not the um, uh, precise equipment that was used there, but still seeing that waste in the carotid uh, bifurcation uh, becomes a little bit nauseating to a surgeon because this, I can't believe this would ever work. And this was in the 90s when a lot of this uh, came along and uh, surprised us in some of the results. Now, some of the early work, again, um, uh, came from a cardiologist who did some training here and then came to UAB. And we did some comparison. And in the early series, the stroke rates were really running 9 to 10 percent. And this was, uh, some of this was done without stents. Some of this, uh, all of this was done without distal or some type of embolic protection. Uh, but we identified that it really did have a, a higher stroke risk, uh, but still less than 10% was clearly less than I would have expected based upon some uh, training I'd gone through. I also found it had a higher embolization rate. Uh, we published that in 99, and I'll show you some uh, data on that. Also had a higher restenosis rate, and this was published by a radiologist from uh, UAB. And that was reported at about 15%, even though that number's probably better today. But again, I wanted to take you through some of the early work. There was also a randomized study done in, uh, in England, published in Lancet in 2001, that uh, corroborated those results. It was about 10% stroke rate. It was an NHS-sponsored study, and they only used stents uh, in about one-fourth of the patients. Started in 92, about the same time it was uh, happening uh, here. 
They did start using stents in the latter part of the study. It didn't get any better. And this is when the real move from this work in the 90s was says we need to do a better job with embolic protection. This is some transcranial Doppler data, should, uh, the part that uh, said we published in 99, that looked at a comparison of endarterectomy versus carotid stenting in the various times during the procedure. And this is, we were routinely using carotid, uh, uh, excuse me, transcranial Doppler on all of the carotid endarterectomy, and so it got moved some to carotid uh, artery stenting. And you can see that there's sort of different times during the procedure for carotid stenting. They had sort of uh, uh, some uh, impressive embolization during catheter uh, manipulation. The mean was uh, 35, and also with balloon deflation, where the mean emboli that were detected on transcranial Doppler um, could be seen. And here's the TCD uh, that you can appreciate, some small high-intensity transits. They're called HITS uh, in the lingo. And then with balloon deflation, uh, sometimes you'd even get a showering of sorts. And uh, those were not always translated to neurologic events, at least uh, clinically detected ones. But in subsequent studies, this can be picked up on MRI, where you can see these ischemic changes in the brain. <clears throat> this is a publication in Circulation out of Italy that looked at 400 procedures uh, when they um, were undergoing carotid stenting and actually found uh, that those patients who had a grayscale median that was low, so a soft plaque on ultrasound imaging, those are the ones more likely to embolize and more likely to have some type of uh, MRI changes. There have been subsequent studies in the U.S. that have confirmed the same thing. They actually found that embolic protection uh, had some improved results. And I think when we started to look at some of this early data, that's when the concern about something going north when you're manipulating the plaque really creates uh, the problem. And that's where various protection devices uh, have become available. There are uh, about three on the market and even a technique called reverse flow uh, that's being uh, popularized uh, today. It was actually uh, first initiated in the early 2000s, uh, all done percutaneously. Now there's one that's done a direct carotid access to limit uh, uh, manipulation through the aortic arch that uh, is thought to probably uh, reduce the stroke rate even more. But it's based upon the principle of reversal of flow to help uh, uh, establish uh, or get the emboli that, or the debris that might be broken up from the carotid manipulation to be aspirated out uh, in a retrograde fashion through the catheter. And they have some reasonable results, but these uh, data are still um, being gathered and the testing is still ongoing. Regardless, we still have this sort of tug of war about which one's really better, endarterectomy uh, versus stenting. <clears throat> there have been uh, studies, most of which occurred from about 2000 to 2010, uh, from multiple sites. I'm going to take you through each one of these, but this is a quick table that looks at the ones uh, uh, done in Europe and in the U.S., and then ultimately what the outcomes uh, were. So first for the SPACE study, this is one that was published in Lancet in 2006. This is a German trial, 1,200 patients. 30-day stroke and death rates were effectively equivalent between the two. The recurrent stenosis rate was higher for carotid stenting, but they said, gee, they're the same, so it's, uh, they're about the same. When you, look, um, uh, when you look at the next report, this is the CREST, no, this is the EVA 3S report out of uh, France. They randomized 520 patients, had a substantially higher stroke and death rate at 9.6% for carotid stenting compared to 3.5% for endarterectomy. That study's been widely criticized because they said they were inexperienced operators, but incidentally, the stroke rate was highest when an operator was being tutored by an experienced operator. So there's a little bit of controversy about that, but this one favored endarterectomy over stenting. The ICSS study, this is the one in Europe, uh, excuse me, in England only, in the United Kingdom. It was published in Lancet in 2010, 1,700 patients randomized. You can see the 30-day stroke death and MI rate was 8.5% for stenting versus 5.2% for endarterectomy. They also did a sub-study of 230 patients to look at how many uh, ischemic lesions were evident on diffusion-weighted MRI, and you can see nearly one in three carotid stent patients suffered this endpoint, even though it was not a primary endpoint, uh, compared to endarterectomy. And again, this slightly favored uh, um, uh, surgery over stenting, but still uh, there was some controversy about it. And lastly, the NIH or NHLBI-sponsored study, CREST, CREST-1, CREST-2 is ongoing now, but CREST-1, randomized 2,500 patients, a little mix between symptomatic and asymptomatic. They had to adjust that based upon recruitment when they were going through the process. But they found that the 30-day stroke death and MI rate were statistically equivalent, 5.2 versus 4.5%. The stroke rate was higher for carotid stenting, 
but the MI rate was higher for endarterectomy. And this is the classic, I know you get consulted all the time about did my patient have a post-op MI? Uh, and uh, clearly this was sort of uh, a new endpoint that wasn't always gathered, particularly in the studies in the 90s. And why? Because, you know, that's when we were following CPKMB. CKMB is not the troponins. So now I still haven't figured out whether a troponin leaks in an MI or not, but I just sort of trying to stay out of that. But that's the question that comes up very commonly. And when you look at those four studies on this bar graph, it looks at carotid endarterectomy on your left, carotid stenting on your right, and I've drawn that red line that shows you, reminds you where the American Heart Association guidelines suggestion was that the um, revascularization complication rate should be 6% or less. And you can see that the carotid stenting is still right on that edge. It's really not low. And this is really all for symptomatic patients, even though there were some of these studies that had asymptomatic patients effectively filling up the uh, total cohort of each group. The point is, is we're still right on the edge in some of these therapies, and that needs to be considered very carefully. Now, lastly, I need to talk a little bit about the MI um, concept, and I should have time to have more discussion because I certainly would like input from the audience. <coughs> How did MI become an endpoint in carotid trials? That was a question because, you know, you're over here really trying to treat safe strokes, you know, and, and improve survivability. I believe it got put in there because MI, if you have an MI after your procedure, there's enough data that suggests that impacts your long-term uh, survival, and so maybe it does need to be considered. It's also because anytime I do something, if I'm going to take a, make a, take a hit out of the heart and that's going to impact their survival, it needs to be considered in my therapy. So I want to talk a little bit about anesthetic technique. And this, uh, again, I was influenced very much by Bob Smith here. But there's also, um, when I did my training, and uh, the use of regional block anesthesia or just field block rather than using general anesthesia for carotid revascularization. It's my favorite approach, but I also want to take you through some other uh, uh, literature that's out there. And this is a publication. It's a, a little bit old, but it also gives you uh, some idea. And this is um, out of uh, St. Louis identified patients that uh, were almost 700 operations over six years, and they were about half and half general versus regional anesthesia. And they noted that there were fewer complications with regional anesthesia, shorter hospitalization, and fewer strokes. And uh, it was their favorite approach, and you can see it was not purely randomized, but it also impacted their own um, treatment paradigm, because as they started moving through this problem, they started using general less in the 90s and uh, local or regional block anesthesia more. Now, I looked at our own results through the 90s at UAB, and we actually, this is a comparison of those patients who had carotid stenting, that's the dark blue, and those who had carotid endarterectomy, you can see there were about 109 carotid endarterectomies, almost 300 stents, all under regional, because uh, at UAB at the time, there were a fair, really sort of surgeon's preference, and I was doing more under local and regional. Uh, and it, from this data shows that the uh, insult was probably less you know, for local regional block uh, carotid endarterectomy, even compared to carotid stenting. There were a few carotid stents done under general, but probably 90 plus percent were done under local anesthesia through femoral access. This goes back to the question, is there really a medical high risk, uh, uh, is there a high medical risk patient for carotid endarterectomy? Sapphire was uh, one of the early studies uh, that compared that high risk patient included both medical high-risk patients, some of those risk factors I already talked about, and some of those surgical high-risk parameters, including recurrent stenosis, radiation stenosis, or surgically inaccessible lesions. Surgically inaccessible would be a very distal ICA up at the level of C1 or down in the intrathoracic component that would require some other revascularization technique. And Sapphire uh, actually compared these two modalities and uh, found that basically uh, carotid stenting potentially was better for some of these high-risk patients. Again, this was a uh, industry-sponsored study. Uh, it was published in New England Journal. It did get some controversy uh, because some other uh, um, concerns behind it. But ultimately, it said, gee, there may be more cardiac morbidity uh, than we appreciate when we go through endarterectomy. And it might be related to the anesthetic. It might be related to the surgical insult itself. Uh, I actually, um, then uh, there's another study, I'm going to take you through the Gala study, but it also, uh, and there's some other reports, and this was that of Mike Stoner uh, out of uh, East Carolina at the time that he published in JBS in 2006, and Gala uh, was published in 2008, that's a European study, that looked uh, at who really can be done um, and uh, how these two techniques might truly compare. <clears throat> 
The GALA study is summarized here. It was 3,500 patients, over 95 centers in 24 countries, again, uh, all in Europe. Um, almost 10 years, and they looked at stroke, MI, and death, and they found there was no difference between anesthetic type. And this sort of throws the whole question, does it really matter whether you go to sleep or you do, you do this under inhalation anesthetic or you do it under regional block? Uh, I was very interested in the study, and I'll tell you that I had some, uh, the, the fundamental disagreement that I had, and this is the forest plot that shows that uh, difference, there was no difference between the two, that patients could only be entered in the study if they were eligible for general anesthesia. So there are plenty of patients uh, that might not be appropriate for general anesthesia. I learned not to say contraindicated to general anesthesia. I wrote that in a publication once, and the uh, chairman of uh, anesthesia from Harvard University promptly sent a letter to the editor said there's no contraindication to general anesthesia. Yeah, I, I presented that to an anesthetic conference, and they all agreed, and I said, oh, you mean you just got to put them to sleep, you don't have to wake them up? Is that what it is? Or so there's a little controversy. So the, the real point is that I think that some patients clearly you don't want to put through a general anesthetic. Uh, Gala suggested it's not any different. So I actually would say for the moderate and low-risk patients, you can do it either way you like. But the high-risk patients, I think they're better with regional. The CREST, uh, again, CREST is an NIH study. CREST actually showed when you put patients through regional anesthesia for carotid nodorectomy, you had fewer MIs. Uh, you can see it's a relatively small group in this uh, 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 total study of 2,200 patients. Only 111 had uh, carotid endotorectomy and a regional anesthesia, uh, anesthesia. They had fewer MIs, fewer strokes, and fewer composite uh, uh, stroke and death endpoint. You notice they have protocol MIs. The p-value was 0.019, and protocol and biomarker only MIs, so that would be the troponin leaks. So Crest actually said it's probably better to do regional anesthesia. And remember, CREST is the one that showed us the MI rate was higher for carotid uh, endoterectomy compared to carotid stenting, but the stroke rate was higher in carotid stenting. They also did a very interesting quality of life uh, study that looked uh, at how much uh, uh, impact each one of these endpoints had on the patient's physical component scale and their quality of life and their mental component scale. So the major stroke you can see up here is the first line. It has a real impact both on a patient's physical quality of life and their mental quality of life. So how their outlook on life. A major stroke's a big deal. A minor stroke, ah, it does have an impact on your physical and your mental component. But if you had an MI, there was really no difference. What does that mean to me? It means to me that, you know, having an MI is sort of like that's, in, and then being out and being social and active, that's just a good cocktail conversation, right? Yeah, I had an MI and I ran the uh, peach tree, you know, and I came in at uh, 55 minutes. So, you know, and, and, but if you have a stroke and you're slobbering, patients don't really want to get out and be quite as active in their regular social life and their regular community life, where it might just be a little, you know, facial droop, but when they are slobbering over their cocktail, they suddenly have a very different outlook on what they're looking at life. So this is the Crest Quality of Life basically said, even though we had MI as being an endpoint in this study, it was not quite as great an impact as a stroke might be for the patient. So who gets which therapy? Um, <clears throat> that's uh, probably the, uh, the real question, and we'll try to get in the last few minutes. And uh, uh, my approach is sort of looking first at the degree of stenosis based upon some measurement parameters I've shown you. Basically follow this with ultrasound. I'm not really going to touch on that now. And then, but then we look at the medical and the anatomic risk. Clearly, uh, there are more carotid stents done now than there were uh, 15, 20 years ago, but I think it's plateaued. It's probably somewhere in the 10 to 15 percent range of the total carotid revascularization. Uh, and this is sort of the algorithm that I use. If it's greater than 60 percent angiographic proven asymptomatic stenosis, which if you're using an ultrasound lab, that typically is going to put you up into a velocity, uh, peak velocity up over 300 and end diastolic over 110. So sometimes categorized as 70 or 80 percent stenosis, depending upon your lab. But if they're asymptomatic, greater than 60 percent, or greater than 50 percent symptomatic, if they're a high-risk uh, patient, I consider medical therapy really is a, a very common first line, but I still have a repair. And then when, if I am going to revascularize a lesion, I assess their risk about their neck, their local neck uh, risk, and also their femoral access, because that's where we'll do carotid stenting. I also consider the lesion is a heterogeneous plaque versus a calcified plaque. That patient's more likely to get an endoterectomy. If it's a recurrent stenosis, that patient's more likely to get a stent. If they have a bad uh, cardiac uh, situation, then I usually will, I will consider a stent. Pulmonary risk, uh, I'll sort of go either way, partly because we don't use inhalation anesthetic, 
And if they're a renal risk, I still have some question, but I'm even a little bit more careful with the stent, more likely to do endarterectomy in that patient. If they're a low risk patient, <clears throat> then I pretty much look at medical therapy versus carotid endarterectomy. Let me take you through a couple of examples. Here's a 50-year-old gentleman who had symptomatic left common carotid stenosis. He'd had a composite resection for cancer, had some radiation, and had a big flap that was laying right on top of this area. This is what I would call surgically difficult to get to. I could get to it. I got a sharp knife, but it's going to be a hard lesion to heal and hard to dissect. So this is one that I think is most appropriate for carotid stenting, and that's what's uh, shown here. <clears throat> what about recurrent stenosis? Recurrent is one I tend to lean on more for stenting over endarterectomy. Uh, here's a 52, and that, that really qualifies as young, and uh, it gets younger and younger every year. Um, and this patient had a right carotid occlusion, so would be considered anatomic high risk by some criteria. His left carotid was 70%. He underwent a left carotid at an outside hospital in 98. He got to me with this uh, lesion three months post, and you can appreciate uh, he's got a pretty tight recurrent stenosis. You might call it a clamp injury. It might be residual plaque where it just flapped over. But clearly, he, he's having a problem because this is uh, his uh, single carotid feeding his brain. <clears throat> I followed him initially, and uh, he had progressed his disease with ultrasound. So I said, let's go back and fix this. And at the time, I thought in, uh, endarterectomy was better. And this is an intraoperative angiogram that just shows that he had a, a nice angiographic result has continued to function well now 20 years later. So uh, you can reoperate on these, even though we tend to uh, um, <clears throat> use stents for recurrent stenosis. There are certain circumstances when it's appropriate to um, open those surgically. There's also a uh, break point in the CREST data based upon the age, and so that's another factor to be considered on who gets what. And what we thought initially is carotid stenting would be better used for the uh, more elderly patient. The CREST data actually um, counter uh, um, uh, provided data that was counter to that point, suggested that those patients who were 69 or older probably should not have carotid stenting because they have a higher stroke risk. So it might, we really should consider it for the patients 69 and younger. And what I really emphasize is be careful anytime you have one tool because you might really get to overly biased, and that's why I think you should incorporate both or all three if I'm going to count medical therapy too and, and how we handle these patients. <clears throat> Here's a 64-year-old lady who was occluded on the right. She'd been treated with uh, Plavix. Nine months later, she came with left eye uh, symptoms. And here's her uh, angiogram. You see she's had a prior sternotomy, had some heart disease. There's a right ICA occlusion. The left, uh, she had a proximal stenosis that was very narrowed, and then also had a torsive vessel and a pretty extensive plaque. Now, angiographically, this would not be called a, uh, it's probably in the tune when you compare here, it might even be 50% barely, but you can appreciate the calcific plaque there. But you add this stenosis down here, and that has an impact. So I actually did a carotid endarterectomy, shortened her carotid, and then did a retrograde stent, and she had a very nice re result. And so this is what I'd say use the combination of both tools. And then the last uh, um, case I want to show you is interesting because he bounced between Atlanta and Birmingham when I was still in Birmingham. He was actually being treated, or evaluated for TAVR here, but had some radiation uh, to his neck. He had a uh, stoma a permanent um, uh, tracheostomy, uh, and he had some questionable symptoms of syncope and had severe carotid stenosis. They didn't want to do his tavern until he had his carotid fixed, uh, but the carotid surgeons here said he doesn't need to have it fixed because he's not truly symptomatic. These are one of these arguments about symptomatic versus asymptomatic. So he got on I-20 and was bouncing back and forth. Uh, and the bottom line, uh, as he got to me, and these are his studies, he was heavily calcified both uh, down here in the anominate artery and the carotid bifurcation, again, this is uh, radiation from lymphoma, had very abnormal studies, both on its ultrasound, had a small right uh, vertebral that had retrograde flow indicating a physiologic impact of his anominate stenosis. Ultrasound parameters are shown here. I said I looked and I sort of uh, went back and forth and ultimately considered him to have tandem lesions <coughs> and treated first as carotid bifurcation uh, with a distal protection device in place, and you can appreciate that uh, right here, and that's the calcific disease. So I stented that, and that's where he had an EPD, and then I had to go down and treat his common lesion. That's his result of the, in, uh, the uh, internal. So here's his common. It's really an anomaly, so we had to do a kissing technique, treat the subclavian and the common carotid at the same time, so dual access. Again, a, a technique that's probably familiar to this audience, uh, but not so common on what we do in uh, uh, standard vascular disease. But it would have been very difficult to get in and treat his uh, heart any other way. 
he had a, a nice angiographic result uh, and then came back here and had his TAVR done about uh, two months after the procedure. Uh, I've had to deal with recurrent stenosis for him too. Recurrent stenosis can be a problem after stents. Uh, this is a 42-year-old gentleman who had bilateral carotid stents after a left hemispheric stroke, so he was symptomatic one side, asymptomatic the other. And then he needed his heart worked on, but he had pretty severe disease, uh, and he was sent back to me about how to approach it. I elected to go after his right side first because that one looked uh, more severe. We pulled the stent out. We can cut these out. We put a patch on, had a nice result, and prepared him. Uh, and he came back up uh, for his 30-day result, and I was going to treat his left side then, but he'd had a silent occlusion. He'd occluded that severe stenosis. There is his um, MRI that shows his old stroke in his left hemisphere. The right side was the side we treated. So he was stable, and uh, we decided not to treat it. He had an asymptomatic silent occlusion on the left. That was an old stroke. was about uh, three years old. And he went on and had his heart fixed, and after he was discharged uh, from his heart, uh, he was supposed to come back and uh, see me at six months. He missed that appointment, but came uh, back in through the emergency room. 11 months post-op, uh, we had a hypertensive crisis, and he had some, uh, he was obtunded. He worsened over the next couple of days, uh, underwent an arteriogram, and then they called us uh, after the arteriogram. And so some of it was our failure of our surveillance method, but you can see he has complete right carotid occlusion. That was his only side. So he now had bilateral carotid occlusion. Incidentally, some people, um, live uh, with bilateral carotid occlusion. I think I can say there are probably some people in here who remember who Norm Van Brocklin was. He had bilateral ICA occlusions. Maybe that's why the Falcons never won during the 70s. Uh, so this gentleman clearly could not. The patient I'm showing you here, so we looked at him. Uh, he had, uh, uh, was going in a near comatose state. Uh, it was looking sort of uh, very marginal. Um, uh, we elected to take him to the operating room and see if we could get some flow back to his brain. We thrombectomized uh, his carotid. Uh, and uh, did an on-table arteriogram, had to put an interposition graft because of the extensive disease. My surgeries are not always that bloody. I need to clean this slide up some for you. Had reasonable perfusion to his brain, uh, put him in a barbiturate coma, didn't work. Uh, I bring this to you just to show you when you have this problem that sometimes we can try to revascularize the acutely occluded carotid, uh, but some of the reports from the 60s said it has a very high mortality. This gentleman really didn't have much uh, alternative, so we gave it a shot and uh, simply uh, it did not work. And so this is reason to be careful um, when you're uh, treating these patients, particularly in some of the surveillance that we have to deal with because I think it's helpful to keep up with them. A reminder, uh, I said at the beginning of the presentation that the carotid uh, artery is the only peripheral artery with proven class one evidence that repair for asymptomatic disease improves survival and reduces stroke. There are new studies. I haven't really hopped into those. We are participating in one here, CREST-2, where we randomize uh, patients in both a medical versus endarterectomy arm and then a medical treatment versus carotid stenting arm for asymptomatic patients. We are participating in that, and that potentially will bring us more value, and we may get more information uh, sometime within the next few years. I have three conclusions for you, then we should have time for questions. My conclusions are carotid artery stenosis can be treated one of three ways. I still consider medical therapy treatment for carotid disease, stenting and endarterectomy. I would have to say stenting has not really been proven to be better. I think it can be equivalent in some circumstances. It needs to be carefully selected. And I think we should uh, continue to consider all modalities when we're treating these patients. Thank you all for your attention, and I have some time for some questions. Thank you, Andy. Well, let me uh, start it out. Um, if asymptomatic disease benefits from therapy, and we live in an era where we're criticized for over-testing uh, with a variety of non-invasive techniques, and we also have patients who come to us and, and ask for tests, um, when, when should we be getting a carotid ult ultrasounds? So um, there's a, a couple of popular screening modalities out there. Lifeline, uh, when you hit 55, they start sending those, um, those uh, mailers to you where you can go to the, you can go get screened um, at your local church or mall. And then for $150, they'll do the carotids, they order in the legs. I think they might check the renals too. Um, the data has not proven that that uh, improves survival and uh, good outcomes. So I guess I'm throwing a little bit of doubt on uh, um, screening is really what I'm trying to say. So I will screen, uh, I will order a carotid duplex for anyone with a brewery. Uh, 
Incidentally, that's not uh, necessarily proven either, so I'll do anyone with a brewery, anyone going through a high-risk procedure that, is a, so, that uh, has atherosclerosis, if I'm doing uh, you know, a large aneurysm, thoracodominal open aneurysm, I will commonly screen those patients. Um, uh, but most of the time, I do not order a patient unless I think they have a large atherosclerotic burden, questionable history of TIA, strong family history. And again, I think the data for screening is not strong, so uh, I would throw some caution on it. It's a little bit painful for me because I make my living off carotid duplex and uh, carotid revascularization, but I think that's what the data shows. Yes, sir. Well, great presentation. Uh, you know, we have seen over time that the number for asymptomatic has gone from 60 to 70 to 80 percent, and I wonder if this is partly due to more uh, medications or better medical management of these patients as compared to aspirin in the 90s and then statins. And now we are going and looking into medications that may bring our LDL even further down. And, and neurologists have always, you know, questioned the surgical or stenting uh, treatment. And they have said that, you know, medical, and I, and I think, I'm sure you have also mentioned that medical is a treatment strategy that all of us, we practice. But I wonder if that's going to push that number even higher from 80%, are we going to 90%? Or is it going to be more individualized care, like patients, you know, when we see on ultrasound ulcerated plaques, I mean, they, I think, behave differently than a smooth, homogeneous 90% stenosis. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Let, let me make sure I'm clear that you're saying, you're saying 50 to 90% in terms of the degree of stenosis or the, popula the number of patients that are being treated for asymptomatic disease? Uh, no, the degree of stenosis. So um, thank you, uh, Kushro. I, I think it's a great question. And the first part I'll touch on is neurology. I have, giving a, I have given a version of this presentation to the neurology uh, uh, population. And in general, uh, they consider um, this disease a flow-limiting disease. Um, most surgeons, most if not all, would consider it an embolic disease. So the stroke occurs when the plaque degenerates and embolizes. Um, there, there's different, um, different studies you know, conclude different information about whether the, the degree of stenosis correlates with the, um, uh, the incidence of a, the, or how prevalent events occur after, the, after the, the diagnosis. In other words, in the asymptomatic study, the ACAS study, the degree of stenosis did not correlate with the number of strokes. And this is the difference. I think what you're pointing out that some are smooth and they stay stable. It's just when you get the ulcerated plaque that becomes unstable and embolizes. Uh, and I wonder if that's uh, how soon you uh, catch the patient too. One that I treated last week had about an 80 to 90 on the left, about a 50 to 60 on the right. But she had had a recent right hemispheric stroke. There was some question about whether or not that was true. It clearly was not as severe, but some of this had embolized, so this was the unstable plaque. So getting back to, I think, what you're trying to ask, as medical therapy improves, are we going to push that number higher because we're going to be able to stabilize this plaque and uh, reduce um, uh, embolization and subsequent stroke? I think that answer is yes. I've seen in my own practice a number of carotid revascularizations gone down because we're seeing, um, I think it's probably some caution. We're not as aggressive <clears throat> chasing the asymptomatic patient as we once were. And I think that's why we're getting this CREST-2 that's randomizing two arms. CREST-2 is randomizing um, medical therapy, which includes specific uh, LDL goals, um, medical therapy versus stenting in one arm, then medical therapy versus endodirection in the other arm. There was one, some suggestion that when you stented the asymptomatic patient, that you potentially fractured the plaque and you made them unstable. You made that plaque unstable and a greater embolic risk particularly when you look at some of the stenting numbers that the asymptomatic stroke rate is not lower uh, than symptomatic stroke in some. Again, there's some mix in those reports. In the surgical reports, asymptomatic has essentially half the risk when they go through the therapy, the implication being the stability of the plaque. So let me circle all the way back. Yes, I think as we get better with medical therapy, we stabilize the plaque. Uh, that we probably will be doing less. And I, you might also argue if we can stabilize and if we can halt atherosclerosis, that might be our key to immortality, right? Because that's where, that's where you're, you're, you're as old as your arteries are, as they say. Does that answer that question? Yeah. Thank, thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, that was, that was a very nice presentation, very balanced. 
Um, so yeah, so I think we're, what's kind of interesting are the parallels between carotid stenosis and disease and coronary, right? It's the same process. And, um, and ultimately, I guess what we're trying to do is to understand the natural history of carotid disease. And, and there's the issue with embolization. There's the issue of anatomic stenosis. There's the evaluation physiologically. With you guys, you can do ultrasound velocities, which, which is nice. Um, but I guess what, what I'm thinking about is can we do better refining the risk prediction of carotid atherosclerosis? And so far we have, you know, the angiogram, we have, and all the challenges you mentioned about the NASET and the European methods, we have um, MRI and CT. Um, you know, there's a lot one can learn about the content of the plaque from a lot of the imaging and in terms of predicting embolization, that's one thought. The other thing is, as you know, computational methods to assess flow across these stenoses in the heart is gaining momentum and perhaps getting into the carotids for those computational tools to understand pressure gradients and flow and combining that with the type of plaque, the amount of remodeling, um, might refine the the predictive risk. Um, let's see. If, uh, we, we just uh, p submitted a paper to Jack that was presented at the ACC, where we found that um, that the shear stress forces in coronary disease, um, if the shear stress is high, it predicts myocardial infarction at three years. Um, and I know that uh, the group, the vascular group, has been working with our engineering tools. So I think the future is pretty bright for layering in novel technologies and bringing in the understanding of vascular biology. And then you put, you layer on top of that some of the work that Arshed does with uh, sort of risk stratification with various, you know, inflammatory and oxidative stress and, and other biomarkers. And I think it, it's pretty exciting that once you layer all that systemic and local uh, risk stratification, we can predict who's going to have an event, and then you stack that against the technologies of carotid stenting and arterectomy and refine this better over time. Uh, uh, great, great points. Thank you for that contribution. The, uh, and when you really get to imaging, probably our best uh, to use, I still believe, is ultrasound. Um, not because it gives you the most data, but because it's sort of that balance between how much it can give you and relatively inexpensive and uh, low risk it is compared to, you know, CTs and MRs and other uh, the, those uh, other parameters that can be used. Because ultrasound, you can see it, and I, I referenced one of the Italian studies that looked at the grayscale median, and that's just one example to see what the lucency of the plaque is. You know, MR is probably more sophisticated, I would say definitely more sophisticated in what it can gather about that, but it's also a little bit more unclear for me, and uh, the um, hurdle of gathering that data is, uh, it's just tougher to get to it. It's tougher to get all the way there. Um, and that's why the ultrasound probably will be our first line um, uh, for the next few years until y'all can come up with something that gives, uh, helps us even more. So thank you for your comments. Very well. Okay, does that conclude? Anyone else? Thank you, Andy. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.